In the book of the prophet Jeremiah, there's a passage that I'm sure you are familiar with and will immediately recognize as quintessentially pro-life. In this passage, God said to Jeremiah, and therefore to each one of us, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This tells us something about God, something about his character, if you will. Namely, that each one of us exists because of a unique and personal act of creation by Almighty God himself. None of us is an afterthought, nor is there some sort of heavenly assembly line slapping bodies and souls together and delivering them willy-nilly to mother's wombs. That is why St. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians takes such care to ensure that we know that of the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, that the greatest is love. Precisely because that is the essence of who God is. God is love, and he created each one of us in love and for love. And since we are to imitate him in all things, it follows that our purpose, our ultimate goal in life is to learn how to be like God, to love as he does, so that we can love like love him, rather, like he loves us, and so that we can love those he loves like he loves us, especially the most vulnerable, especially those yet unborn. Now, from last week, we learned that joy is determined by what we love, and also that we experience joy when some good happens to those we love. That is why we have such joy in the hope that the leaked draft Supreme Court decision overturning the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling will soon be made official. We love life and we love children. And since life is one of the greatest goods we can wish for anyone, to see the day when the right to life is restored to all unborn children cannot help but fill us with joy. How long we've prayed for this day. Let us continue to pray that this great victory in the battle for life will come to pass. Yes, the war for life will continue at the state level. Yes, there is much more to do. But this will be no small victory, and so we rightly rejoice in this turning back away from the culture of death. I think it's instructive to read a few short excerpts from the 98-page draft decision, for it reaffirms what pro-life Christians and other men and women of goodwill have said from the beginning since the horror of legal abortion began in our country. And it's also important to note that the reasoning in the draft is not based on a religious or natural law argument. Rather, it's based on the truth that right reason can reach when the meaning of the actual words of the Constitution are taken at face value. That the draft is based on this kind of reasoning is, in my opinion, a good news and a bad news story. Good news in that it acknowledges that truth and history cannot be manufactured, wished into existence, or derived implicitly from the so-called penumbra of the Constitution. Nor can our country's actual history be put down the famous memory hole from the novel 1984. Judicial decisions must be rooted in facts and on what the Constitution actually says. That the decision is based on such reasoning is bad news in the sense that natural law, 
which comes to us from God, should have a central place in the moral compass of our nation, but it's not mentioned at all. Perhaps that will come with time, for natural law used to have a privileged place in our legal system when we could legitimately claim that we were a Christian country. Be that as it may, here are some excerpts from the draft. Quote, Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. Its reasoning was exceptionally weak, and the decision has had damaging consequences, unquote. And, quote, the Constitution makes no reference to abortion, and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one on which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. That provision has been held to guarantee some rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution, but any such right must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty." Unquote. Now, the last 30 pages of the draft decision lists all the state statutes criminalizing abortion from 1868 on, as well as all the statutes from the territories that became states since that time. Every single state, as well as the District of Columbia, outlawed abortion. There is not a single exception. From this, the court reasons, quote, the inescapable conclusion is that a right to abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. On the contrary, an unbroken tradition of prohibiting abortion on pain of criminal punishment persisted." Unquote. And as a final quote, it is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. Unquote. It seems appropriate on what we pray will be the end of legal abortion at the national level to consider what it has cost us. How many lives have been lost to the culture of death since 1973? And to put it in perspective, I decided to compare the lives lost due to abortions to the lives lost due to executions, murders, and war in the United States. Since 1976, when the death penalty was reinstated, about 1,534 people have been executed, with 2,450 still on death row. Since 1973, nearly 900,000 people have been murdered. Over the entire history of our country, more than 245 years, over 1.3 million soldiers have given their lives in defense of this country. How many children have been lost to abortion since 1973? when abortion became the law of the land. The Guttmeyer Institute, the research arm of Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion provider in the United States, reported that over 63 million abortions have been performed since 1973. More than 28 times all the other causes of death I mentioned combined. They also estimate that nearly one in four women in the United States have had an abortion. These are heartbreaking statistics. The cost of Roe versus Wade has been staggering in lives, as well as in the cultural decline it has brought to our nation and the world. Satan 
is the one who brought death into the world because he hated a life-giving and loving God, a God who creates an eternal soul where none existed before. Satan was envious, hated that he didn't have that power, hated that God cherished each soul he created. And since he couldn't get at God, Satan decided to get at those God loved through war, hatred, and fear. How do we find our way back? How do we transform our culture of death back into a culture of life? Without fail, we must continue to reach out to those women who are contemplating an abortion or recovering from one. The vast majority of women who have abortions are young, scared, and under immense pressure from the father of the child, friends, or even family. They feel trapped and see abortion as the only way out. They might have chosen life had someone reached out to them. And we also need to win the hearts and minds of all Americans for life. Children are a gift from God, and we need to recover this fact throughout the country and our world. This war for life is a war for the soul of America. That, my brothers and sisters, is also part of our mission of love to the world. Our prayers, our time, our financial support for pregnancy centers like Elizabeth New Life Center and organizations like Dayton Right to Life and Project Rachel that minister to women recovering from abortion as well as supporting our own Emanuel pro-life group are concrete ways we can live out this mission of love. St. Pope John Paul II, in his encyclical, The Gospel of Life, encouraged women who have had an abortion not to give in to discouragement or lose hope. He said to them, If you have not already done so, Give yourselves over in humility and trust to repentance. The Father of mercies is ready to give you his forgiveness and his peace in the sacrament of reconciliation. Nothing has been definitively lost, and you will also be able to give or be able to ask forgiveness from your child who is now living with the Lord. As a result of your own painful experience, you can be among the most eloquent defenders of everyone's light, right to life. I'll close with this. If you know someone who's had an abortion, look for an opportunity to reach out to them in love. If you've had an abortion, I want you to know that God never stopped loving you. And it was you he had in mind when he said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you and loved you. My love for you still runs deep. And my love never fails.